Hey guys, Keith here. Um, another update video. Again, we're, we're covering 2019.19 through to 2019.32 and a bit. There's a couple of things in this build that, that go beyond uh, 32. Um, this video, I'm going to focus on the changes to uh, largely to the layout tab. Um, and we're going to quickly run through that. There's not as many layout tab changes, so hopefully this video is a little shorter than the setup tab um, video. So let's get started. Okay, offset of models when pacing it. Oh, this is a trivial little thing, but um, not surprisingly, it's kind of desirable. So if you're pasting a model, Xlights will now just offset that model as it pastes it so that um, it's previously when you did it would paste them all on top of each other and of course that was not very useful. Um, so yeah, something that's a little bit easier to use um, when you're doing uh, cut and paste on the models. Um, add custom model import onto matrices and trees as submodels including the submodels faces and states. What the hell is that? Well, let's define a matrix. Let's define a reasonably dense matrix. I don't know. Let's make it 50 rows by 50. That's reasonably dense. Now let's uh, let's say um, I love these uh, these models that um, I can download here. But I have a problem, right? I, I, I actually just want to use one of the designs in the downloadable models, but I want to display it on my matrix. So as this thing downloads, let's go and choose something. I don't know, just one of the small snowflakes will do. And we'll insert it. Okay, um, I'm going to export that model. Um, and let's say I wanted to display or use that layout of pixels in my matrix and basically have a snowflake on my matrix. Well, what you can now do is you can come down here to submodels. And there's now this import custom. And if I click on import custom and click on my snowflake model, I can choose where to orientate it. Now, generally, you're probably going to want it in the middle, but you could move it to the right or the left or the top or the bottom or the corner. But let's just put it into the middle. And what it's done is it has imported that snowflake. And if I come over here and I click on the title here, you can see the snowflake pixels have all been highlighted. So basically, it's created a submodel on the matrix which has the same pixel layout as this snowflake that I downloaded. And then, of course, because what's the point? Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you want to come into here and find my matrix model, double click to open up my sub models, and I'm going to throw a bars effect on my snowflake model. And there you go, my matrix looks like a snowflake. I don't know, I'm sure someone will use it. <laughs> Sometimes you do things just because you can. Um, increase the maximum spirals on the spiral tree model. So for those of you that are not aware, um, the, the tree model is actually a very flexible model. Um, and one of the things that some people like to do is let's create 200 pixels. Let's make it one string. Looks great. That's a single line. But one of the things you can do is you can put the number of um, spiral wraps. Um, and as you increase the number of spiral wraps, you end up with a tree. And I think this was limited to about 20 or something and someone wanted more. And so now you can have more and more spiral wraps around your tree to the point where it gets quite silly. I, I guess you need a lot more than 200 pixels for that to make sense. But anyway, any rate, that parameter got increased. Alternate pixel wiring to the spinner model. I don't know why I didn't do this. Well, I actually do know why, because the algorithm's a pain. But um, with the spinner model, um, historically, there were wiring patterns here where you could start on the outside and come in and go out and come in and go out. Or you know, ones where you start in the middle and come out and then you come back in and then you come in from the middle and, and then jump over here and then go out and so forth. 
But one of the, the wiring patterns that actually quite makes a lot of sense with spinners is the one where you jump over pixels on the way out and then on the way back, you fill them back in. And so every strand starts and ends in the middle, which makes uh, spinners like this much, much easier to wire up. And so, um, I have added the center alternate counterclockwise and clockwise as wiring patterns now for the spinner. And so if you look at the wiring view for that spinner, you'll notice that you know, it starts here at number one, it jumps over number 10 to number two, jumps over nine to three, four, five, then it finally hits the end at six, and then it jumps on the way back in. And so this is, if you particularly if you're wiring with, uh, with nodes, um, this is a much, much better wiring pattern because your joins, particularly if your spinner is, is quite narrow in the center, there's actually not even necessarily any need to cut and join anything to create a spinner like this. And so it just seemed to be a, a much more sensible wiring pattern to use. Um, shift scroll wheel. Um, so I don't have a scroll wheel on, on my computer at the moment, but basically what this is saying is if I come into a custom model like this, and let's imagine that this was a lot bigger, uh, if you hold the shift key down and roll the scroll wheel here, uh, this model or this panel here will slide left to right. Obviously, if you just move the scroll wheel, it will scroll up and down. So it just makes it a little bit easier to get around this dialogue, particularly if you're editing a really, really large custom model. Um, so that's what that one's about. Um, allow the user to control model handle sizes. Okay, so these are currently on their default and this is how they've always been, these little blue handles. And obviously in 3D, right, you get these, these little arrows and um, uh, if I grow here, the little handles, etc. But now under settings, there is a, he says, model handle size and you can actually set them all the way up to extra large. And you can see that suddenly those boxes become a lot bigger, the arrows become a lot bigger, and therefore it's a lot easier to grab hold of things and move them, etc. particularly if your eyesight's starting to go, you're getting old like I am, uh, and you're struggling to see things. Um, that also works nicely in 2D, where it makes those boxes nice and big as well. So. Yeah, just for those that are hard of seeing um, or just struggle with the dexterity to get the mouse on those things, it, it makes it a lot easier to handle your models. Control A keyboard shortcut should have always been possible, but if you come here and press Control A, it will select all the models for you. Kind of nice. Uh, uh, add import of previews and models from another RGB effects file. Okay, so this is a kind of curious one. Um, found it, it's, it's kind of really more orientated towards people that, you know, are rebuilding their layout but want to grab stuff from another layout. Um, you basically now have this right click menu where you can go import models, uh, previews and models. And what you can do is you can go to another show folder. So I don't know, I'll go to my documents, my lights. This is my show folder. I'm gonna grab that RGBFX file. And basically these are all the models in my RGBFX file. Now I don't have any previews. Um, if I had previews, I can bring in previews as, oh actually I do, I have an unassigned preview. But you can bring in previews as well, not just models. So I can come in and say, actually, these models here, oh, let's use the keyboard, it's a little bit faster. I wanna bring them into this uh, show, I click OK. Now obviously there are start channel problems because they're not defined here, but it's just bought in my Snowflake Tower and I can now go and set all those properties and these are now in this show. So uh, I, I see it as being more useful where people are rebuilding their display and they want to go and grab a model from um, their previous display and they don't want to have two copies of x lights and copy and paste. You can just import them in this way. Anyway, a feature. 
Uh, check sequence to check with matrices where strands and strings. Yeah, so this one's an interesting one because I chased a bug down on this one and it surprised me. So what if, um, and I think what it was, was I, it was a model that someone had defined which was 10 by 10, which is not very dense. Um, actually, no, it was it was one string of a hundred nodes per string, and he put strands per string as eight, and it looks fine, right? Um, the problem is, is it doesn't work fine. If you come up and look at the matrix up here, um, and you uh, yeah. Uh, if you if you look at this, yeah, so you can see how it's showing 96 nodes. Yet clearly down here, I've defined 100 nodes. So something very, very odd going on here and it led to a whole bunch of problems. And so now, because whenever I have a problem like that, particularly one that's hard to spot on the fly, we update check sequence. And a few minutes later, up it comes. And it now tells me, you know, warning, uh, control upload, matrix model on control ads. Oh no, it's not that one. Uh, where are we? Matrix. Uh, start channels, overlapping. There's a few problems with this so far. Oh, here we go. Model matrix strands are not equally sized. Eight does not divide into the string length 100. Evenly, as a result, only 96 of 100 nodes are initialized. Okay, so just trying to catch detailed errors that occur in your display. All right, we'll keep going. A couple of more things, then we'll break this video. Add an active property to models so you can hide models from the display. So, what happens if, um, you know, for some reason, I don't know, maybe this is a prop that you're speculating with and you're not including it in this year's show, or maybe it's a prop that you only use at Halloween and, you know, you want to be sequencing Christmas. There is now a property on the model, which is, um, uh, he says, not remembering where he put it. There it is, active, uh, which controls whether or not the model is active. And if you make something inactive, it stops appearing. Um, it still does appear up here, but it doesn't appear in um, in your display. So when you go over and you do sequencing, that prop just won't appear on the display. It won't clutter up the screen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when you want to bring it back, you can just make it active again, and it comes back. Much like you can with all of the. Um, in 3D with all of the 3D objects where you go, you can take this grid sitting here in the background, click on it and make it inactive and it disappears. So it's a similar concept to that, except it applies to models. Uh, when it's inactive, um, it won't show up in any of your previews, etc. And I don't think it shows up for sequencing either from memory. Um, all right. Consolidate custom model node missing errors to Yep, okay, so again, if we create a, a custom model and if we come in here and we define node one and, I don't know, six, um, when you run check sequence, you would get an error here, which would say, oh, model two, node two's missing, node three's missing, etc." But you would have got an error for each and every one of them. Now with check sequence, what it's smart enough to do Again, we wait a second while it scans through everything. And now what it does when it's checking the model, custom model. So now it gives you one error saying custom models missing nodes two to five. Now you, you might get two or three errors if you've got several ranges missing, but it will always aggregate together any consecutive missing nodes and give you one error message instead of lots of error messages um, in the, in the uh, check sequence. 
Uh, model faces, states, imports, remembers any custom colours between accesses to the colour dialogue. Yeah, this is, I, mean, I, I didn't realise anyone cared about this, but someone obviously did. And so we added it. And so I'll, I'll show it, I don't know, let's just do faces. Um, we'll add a face. Give it a name. If you force custom colours in here, and you go over and you say define a custom color you pick a custom color you add it oops okay okay all right, it's an interesting behaviour of the dialogue. All right, and you click OK. Now, if you come into another row here, that custom colour is still there, and obviously you can come back here and define another one. I think you have to select a box first. Yeah. No. Hello. Well, that's weird. That's not our dialogue. I wonder why it's not working. There it goes. That's some strange behaviour. All right. Um, so yeah, so now it remembers it. In fact, it, it even remembers it next time you come back in. So basically during, um, for however long you run X lights, it will remember those colours. It won't remember them between sessions. But for people that are setting multiple things to the same colour, but a custom colour, that obviously will save them a little bit of time. And that's it. That's all the changes on the layout tab. So again, I'm going to take a break there and uh, we'll come back with a walkthrough of all the changes on the sequencer. Thanks guys. Mm -hmm.